this year we'll calve out uh, roughly 650 or 700 cows, some of our own, some are on share, and some are for a neighbor. Um, we also run a stocker yearling uh, enterprise where we'll have about 500 um, steers that will run on grass, as well as developing our own replacement heifers. In some ways, we just had to rethink our nutrition and how are we going to feed these cattle that time of the year. Um, and so that's resulted in, you know, they don't want to eat alfalfa hay at the end of April when there's grass to graze and, and we're, we're, we're keeping them on grass. They're not in a confinement or a, a dry lot or a, you know, the calving pasture where the grass, there's no grass left because they ate it all. I mean, we're, we're continually moving them. And so we got to think about how do we, if they need supplement, how, what are we going to give them that they'll actually consume? Um, protection can be a little bit of a challenge. Uh, you know, like in 2019 in May, we had cold, wet rain for, 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 for about a week. And I had the cattle in about the worst possible location, uh, that I could have picked. And, uh, I won't do that again. You know, so there's just some things that you don't think about until you, until it's kind of in your face. I think there's some things like that, uh, where you can work together with somebody else in the area and, and really make, make something like that, make a, a mutually beneficial partnership with somebody that calves earlier. You also could look at it from the standpoint of, uh, where are you getting your replacement stock? You know, if somebody calves in March and April, maybe you can buy their later calving cows from them or their late calving pairs, um, help them kind of make their calf crop more uniform, you know, and, and then you could uh, get replacement animals from them and not have to dedicate another set of pastures for your own replacement heifers. So there, I think there's a lot of, uh, you know, like I said, ways that you can work together with a neighbor. Okay, so as far as um, is making these changes and, and the bumps that come with it, um, we keep our own replacement heifers. So um, we've, we've recognized that in our herd, traditionally we've had an abundance of milk. Um, so we're trying to change that animal, just a moderate amount of milk, and, and change that frame size of that mature animal. We've realized we've had way too much milk and way too much size. So it's, it's kind of been a fun, a fun challenge, a, friend, a fun process to try to, to try to create that type of animal that works well in our environment. And we're seeing, seeing gains in that. We would ideally like a, a 1200 pound cow um, for, you know, that would be the, the stopping point and then just keep, keep refining it, you know, once you, once you get to that point. Um, right now we're still a little bigger than that, but we have several that would fall into the category of, of the perfect cow for, for our place. Um, but that, that would be a four frame cow with less than 15 milky PD and, and 1,200 pounds, that would be perfect. So if, if a cow loses a calf on our place, she's, she's gone. Um, you know, that's just, it's a one-time deal. And if she doesn't have a calf with her, that's, that's it for that, I guess, is how we manage them. Just, it's a, it's a clean line that way. And Critical right now is to make sure that all the cows are at least in a body condition five. And maybe the heifer's in a five and a half or six. Um, we have time to put gain on to cows to put condition in. Because we can, we can put gain on a cow as a condition up until a month prior to her calving. So I have until the 1st of April to put gain on a cow if she needs it. Um, the other thing is docility. I don't want a cow to run away from me and I certainly don't want a cow to come run at me. And so docility out in the middle of the pasture, if there is something, and of course we always tag every calf, so we are gonna be in, in the mix of that cow. We turn the bulls out about the 27th of July. So the calves are being born the tail end of April, 1st of May. We're really going at it hard about the 8th of May. Um, everything at the Bluebell calves on grass. Um, they, a lot of the cows actually never get off sod. Um, from the time they're a replacement heifer to the time they leave the ranch as, you know, like their productive life is over, they've never left sod. Um, you know, that takes a lot of considerations when you're talking about your mineral programs, when you put cows on grass, and then um, actually getting the bulls out on time. And the first couple of years, it was, you know, it was a learning curve, um, and it was, we need to have or we, we realized, you know, the importance of the mineral programs and the importance of, 
keeping enough replacement heifers to make that change. They've done that for about three years and they've got that, their conception rates are still in that window that they were when they kept the bulls out for 60 days instead of 42. Mm. You get to the 18th of February, you're not feeding as hard because it's, you know, a wind chill of zero degrees out. You can kind of rough that cow through a little more. And then when she needs her energy demand, she's getting them more from the ground and the soil instead of from the feed wagon. Before I started making the changes to later calving, <clears throat> I'd, I'd been to some seminars and workshops on it. And the people there warned me about some things to expect, like for instance, fallout from your cows. Uh, some of your cows aren't gonna be able to do well on a later calving date, and some of your cows aren't gonna be able to do well on a less vigorous feed regimen like I used during the winter. So there were, there were some, some learning curve, if you will. So we switched to leaving the calves on the cows during the winter, weaning later and calving later, and we ended up with more open cows. <clears throat> That's, that's kind of straightened itself out. Um, I'd say I run about 15% opens right now, which is higher than some, but like I said, at my place, the cows work for me, I don't work for them, and so I'm okay with some extra fallout. There are some issues if you've got heavy milking cows and you're calving later on greener grass, sometimes you have some issues with sore udders. So there's a culling process where you need to weed that out or you are spending time getting pears in to help them drink. And everybody has this concern that, well, my calves aren't going to be as big. They aren't going to be as profitable. But I can tell you, by the time you figure the profitability in from not calving in winter conditions, uh, you figure in the fact that you have less labor, you figure in the fact that you have more live calves, uh, it's pretty tough. Uh, and I think with out most exceptions anyhow that, that uh, anybody I've talked to is more profitable in the long run. Do it more gradual. In other words, you aren't going to affect those cycles near as much if you move a week or two at a time versus two months at a time. So uh, doing a gradual change, uh, say from March to May, uh, leads you into going into April, and I describe that as uh, hopping out of the frying pan and into the skillet. Uh, maybe even worse, uh, and, and so you can have uh, some concerns doing that. I think it depends on the circumstances. If you uh, have got ideal calving situations, maybe some of that tall uh, residual cover in grass that we were talking about, where those calves have good cover, you can probably get by with that in April. Uh, if, if you only had 50 head of cows, you may get by with that move in April. If I had 1,000 head of cows, uh, I, would, I would probably make the move all at once uh, to avoid the April calving and uh, be prepared, either keep a lot of heifers on hand or, or uh, have some cows available to buy or, or make sure your banker's on board to to help absorb the fact that you may have uh, some open cows by making that much of a move. On the other hand, uh, again, it's what you end up with that counts and, and uh, you might have more open cows, but you may have a lot more live calves and so the economics of it may warrant going ahead and skipping from March to May. In 1990, we weaned the same time every year and the young cows the last week of October and the older cows the first week of November. That was our plan and we stuck to it if the weather uh, uh, cooperated. But we didn't look at the cows and say, you know, do the cows, are they ready to wean? Or are they fat? Can they still milk for a while, lactate and, and keep the calves on? And uh, that it was a big change. Uh, watching the cows and uh, and, and moving the, uh, rotating more, gave those cows uh, bigger, more shots of, of protein and energy. And, and we found that, that now we're weaning in January, February. And, but we're still watching the cows. The date means nothing. It is, do the cows tell us it's time to wean? 25 years ago, we weaned in November because the weather got kind of bad and we thought, well, we better wean. So we did, it was a good idea. But then the weather got nice, and, or it was just an average winter, and the cows got so fat 
You know, by the time we calved in May, they were, they were maybe not too fat, but they were lazy all winter. They didn't have to work. Well, this winter, when we calved, when we weaned in February, it, uh, the older cows, they were working hard in November, December, January. We were rotating them to fresh pasture every 30 days or so. And these cows were in medium condition and they were lactating for a good part of the winter. This is a very, a very low stress, um, healthy environment for a calf. And they're also out there learning with their mom how to graze, what to graze, how to, how to survive in the winter. So those replacement heifers are getting an education. If we had weaned them in October, and, and uh, they'd have to learn that on their own. We don't have a heifer development program anymore. We just put our bulls out with our heifers. They p figure out which ones they're gonna breed, which ones are gonna cycle early, conceive, and have a calf. <clears throat> Those are the ones we move over into our cow herd. The rest of them just stay in the stalker program. I, I think once we got into this system, we're seeing less fallout um, than, we, than we did at first, but we still have some fallout because we put a lot of pressure on them. You know, we leave the calves on the cows all winter, and so they do have that pressure on them. Uh, and so some of them lose some condition, but usually we're on green grass for 40 days before they calf, and it's the green uh, spring flush. So they usually pick up uh, their condition really quickly. And so they're usually fat when they calve again, which is a critical issue. So that's a, a, it's a pretty good fit, getting our cows fit with our, our forage cycle, get their nutrient demands uh, fit with our forage cycle. Another thing that we did to minimize that is when we made our calving switch from March 19th to May 1st, the first year that we made that switch, we ran 40 cows open that we didn't put a bull with by themselves. Uh, we ran them open by themselves because they had problems and we'd been keeping them in our herd, running them through our barns for years. And they might have a, a, a bad uh, teat or they might have a bad udder that we'd have to get them in and milk them or they might push their calf around and we'd have to separate them from their, uh, from their baby. And so we had kept track of all that and so when we went, when we switched calving dates, we sorted all those cows off and we didn't breed them. So we had, we had 40 cows that weren't going to be a problem the first year that we knew would have been. So I, I think that could be a, a real learning curve minimizer. Here we'll calve in June, July. Um, front end, uh, we'll buy heifers, we'll breed our own heifers, um, breed our heifers to start 1st of April. I don't want to say if a guy can't build a perfect cow. I don't think I have time. I don't think I don't think I have the I know I don't have the knowledge that guys have. Some guys are super smart that way. Um, I can buy certain cows certain places and make them fit my operation. Certain heifers make them fit my operation. I still look at it as gross pounds sold off my place on the cows and they got to do their job. Everybody chewed my ass because they thought our cows looked like shit. But our preg rate was like seven and a half percent. Um, was really good. I mean, I thought the cows, I thought the cows looked good. My wife was like, mm, they look all right, you know. In the, in the perception of we're calving out in this big pasture, two miles away from any set of corrals, what do we do if we have calving problems? Well, number one, the calving, most of the calving problems go away, and number two is. If you have a problem, and we go through them once a day, and it, but if you have a problem, they'll show up right then. So you can walk that animal two miles into the corral and pull it, and if she won't go that far, our cattle are tame enough and used to us, we can easily get walk up behind it and get a hold of a, a leg, and then you're in control of that animal. And, uh, and yes, we've lost some cows because we missed them, but we lost cows when we was calving them in the in the lots also, but um, it's the amount of time we spend with them is quality time now. It's not working time. It, it's and that's another one of our indicators is when we see those cows go back and graze on what they were they were in two or three days ago. We're not giving them enough on the other end, so we have to start making our pastures bigger. 
The cows will tell you what's going on, whether they're happy or not. So if you pay attention to your cows and your calves, you can usually uh, stop a sickness before it ever even hits your animals. The age of our cows is, is getting older and older all the time, and they're still staying productive. Uh, for the main fact is we don't breed our, our heifers as yearlings, we wait till they're two. So their first calf is when they're three. They've matured and they can, they can keep that weight on easier after you let them mature before they had a calf. But uh, this, the cycle of them losing weight, I mean, it's, Mother Nature designed that. God designed that for us to, to let them lose weight because in nature, the deer lose weight. Right now, the deer out there, they look terrible. And, uh, and the cows, it, it don't hurt them to let them lose weight. As long as you give them enough time to recover before they have that, that calf in the spring, summer, whichever you want to call it. But they have to be fully recovered by the time they calve or it'll be tough to get them bred. Okay. Yeah, I are two-year-olds and then from there they go right in with our cows and the bulls. And they stay in our, in our, with our cows until they don't have a calf anymore and then they're, then they're called, so. Okay. Pat will say this too, and I would agree with him. We created more problems by having the cattle close in the lots, looking at them all the time. Oh, she is struggling, we better get her in and pull her. Whereas if she'd have been out and you weren't even aware that she was having, calving, and then she'd have had it on her own. He said, I, and I would agree, absolutely agree with him in that, that we create more calving problems by our constant watching. So, so, and then when you're not watching and, you know, then you're, they, they're, they, you know, they can settle down and lay down and do their job without so you coming out and looking at them and then they get up and then they have to walk around some more. I mean, I just do, I do believe that. Yeah, okay. Uh, one of the biggest mistakes we made was, uh, <clears throat> I'd gone to the Dick Divin School and they had run cows through the winter and body conditioning score of high twos and threes, got them through the winter, they calved, they rebred and, and they went on. My cows weren't anywhere close to that, but they were in tough condition. Uh, I was just testing them a little and I did and as I look back now, we had a lot of high percentage Gilvy and limousine cows. They immediately fell out because they just take a lot of groceries to to maintain them. And we had a lot of black baldy cows that really milked. And uh, so therefore I had some troubles there, but I got to the point to where anything that I had trouble with, they're gone. There's just too many good cows out there to keep, keep a bad one just because she might look good to you. So we roded a lot of those cows, went through them. Uh, we started, we bought all of our replacements, whether it was heifers or bred cows, we bought them all. So we went through a lot of cattle to start with. And we finally got down to where we were raising most of our replacement heifers. So that was a plus. Uh, they just stayed right with the mamas and that's the way they calved. Yeah, uh, we move, we try and move different every year. Uh, <coughs> We move clockwise and those cows start anticipating that move and so we'll rotate counterclockwise just to slow them down. But by the second rotation, they know where they're going next. They're going backwards or forwards. So they're very quick to pick up on what you're doing. Uh, it's It's been a learning experience, but it's, you know, we're able to work with these cows, kind of play with different things, different ideas. So we just don't broadcast everything we're trying. The only thing living beside the highway, all your neighbors get to see what you're doing, <laughs> which is kind of detrimental at times, but so no. You know, I, I called a lot of old cows and bag management. One thing you really got to look out for because before we was all about milking. You know, you got to get that high milking. Just learning what I learned, you know, that's a big issue when you go into May calving, you know, and I know I'm still going to run into issues because, you know, it, it's just going to happen.
getting down to a more moderate frame is is kind of something I think would be a good thing if you're going to try this May calving because then big cows you're going to have a lot of milk you know so you know normally I was at a three percent conception or open rate the last two years I just doubled my herd in buying I went to seven percent which was bad for me but almost all of those were co cows I had purchased and then this year was even worse because I even went lower input and stopped giving the crutch to the cows and they had to work for me and I was a little higher. Well, them are the cows that were causing my operation to be a high input. So I, it didn't hurt me to get rid of them, but you just gotta be prepared that you might lose a large portion if you start going low input and and getting pull the crutch out from your cows. Um. We've had a lot of grass this year. We've started strip grazing our cows this fall, moving them every one to three days. It just depended on what was going on. But, um, and we changed the cow behavior and really turned her into a grazing animal. You know, for me, one of the things that I didn't think about happening is I'd been, uh, I've never had a purchase cow on the place. I've always raised my own replacement heifers and I've always, kind of concentrated on growth and putting milk into those cows. So that first year that I didn't put my bulls in with the cows till August 1st, I still had big heavy calves come October on my calves or on my cows and I I had to get them off off of those cows and get rid of the calves. So that left my cows all winter to recover. Um get fat and by the first of may i saw some problems when they started calving a lot of those older cows had swing bags uh, my fault one thing i didn't think about doing but i got rid of those cows the next year i didn't wean till christmas time i purposely pull those cows down get them pretty thin um, take the calves off, kind of cut them back on hay. Come April, I have grass out there to turn them on. And uh, there's green grass coming in that old grass. By the time they start calving, they're, they're in great shape. They're slick and healthy and ready to calve. Several years ago, I was reading an article about a big ranch that never keeps a heifer calf out of a cow younger than eight years old. They want them out of proven cows. So I started doing that several years ago, uh, keeping heifer calves out of my older cows. They're proven, they've had a calf every year, they don't have bad feet, they don't have bad eyes or bad bags. And uh, I think that's really starting to help my longevity, keeping those cows in the herd longer is, is doing that. Now maybe you're giving up some of the newer genetics by doing that, but, uh, I, I think it, uh, that I'm getting more benefit by doing it the way I'm doing it than keeping heifers out of the younger cows or 